this is the last presentation of this block, and then we have like some lunch break. So I have here another Adelaide Python Meetup member. So Oliver Holmes, which is a senior software developer with over 15 years of experience, uh, worked in lots of GIS projects. He's going to give a nice presentation about Flask, our full stack application in using uh, tiles. Very interesting. Uh, OK, Owen, it's with you. 30 minutes. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm really, I was really happy to see such a big geospatial presence at the conference. So that's, that's exciting. Uh, so as, uh, as Pedro was saying, um, a, a little bit about me. I'm currently a senior software engineer working for Anditi, which is an organization that provides geospatial visualization and analysis. I've been a software engineer for over 15 years, and I've worked on a variety of projects. But I'm, I'm passionate about geospatial data management and delivery. Uh, so the goal of uh, this, this presentation is to talk about transforming and optimizing large image data sets for dynamic use on a, a front-end interface. So, uh, when I, where, well, I've, been work, I've worked for organizations in the past where we've, we get large image data sets, often from uh, aerial photography, um, and what you can get it from you know, aerial photography or satellite data. And you get the files that you get from that are typically single large data sets, and you, know, it, you need to be able to put them in a format that you could use. So, what we do is we take those large image data sets and we transform them into a slippy tile format. Um, and then we, we store that data in a cloud store, and then we create uh, an API endpoint to access that data. Uh, and then we can also uh, enhance the data through that API endpoint um, and manipulate that data in transition. So you know, why, do, why do we do this? Um, so when we get those large files, sometimes those large files can be you know, multiple gigabytes in size. And uh, it's pretty difficult to download all that data to your computer straight away. Um, so uh, we, we put it into this tiled format. And this tiled format allows us to more easily stream that data to the end user. Um, you would be probably familiar with this using um, similar t technologies like Google Maps, which really um, certainly created a, a big um, you know, industry in terms of providing you know, raster data for, for general use. And um, they were one of the original inventors of the slippy map tile format. Um, and uh, yeah, it allows us to more easily access that data on uh, a web app or a mobile device. Uh, for this example, I'm using a data set that I obtained from Open Aerial Map. Um, open Aerial Map is a, a great open source repository of aerial imagery where you can, you can download aerial imagery that other people put up online. Uh, aerial Map is a great example because it provides you know, raw files, uh, raw geotiffs that are pre-built um, that you can, you can download and you can test. So if you, if you wanted to try out some of this sort of stuff yourself or you know, play around with some geospatial tools, it just gives you the ability to, to have a, some open uh, imagery to be able to use. Uh, for this particular example, I'm using a, a town in Laos. Uh, so um, a bit more about the slippy tile map format. So the slippy tile map format works uh, in a pyramid structure where you have at the top, you have uh, one tile that would represent a, a large area. So one tile would represent the entire Earth. And then at the bottom, where you have finer detail uh, with um, tiles that represent close to the ground. So at the top, you could have a single tile all the way down to billions of tiles that could represent the higher detail um, at ground level. Uh, these Tiles are separated up into rows, columns, and zoom levels. So an x, y, and z coordinate. Um, so 
for, for this example, and there is a lot of uh, geospatial libraries that you can, you can use for uh, manipulating raster data, um, one particular tool that is, uh, is, is great to use as well is called uh, Raster.io, but for this example, I'm actually uh, using a tool called uh, GDAL. Um, the reason why I use GDAL is because GDAL is one of the underlying pinning technologies of things like Raster.io. Um, and uh, so you, you kind of have a bit more access to the functionality. Um, so it gives me, um, in some cases, it's given me a bit more freedom to, to work with the, the data. But for a lot of general cases, things like Raster.io are really good as well. Uh, then I'm going to store this data in um, AWS uh, using the uh, S3. Um, and uh, I'm also using Boto3, which is part of the AWS SDK for Python. Uh, for GDAL, GDAL is a C++ um, project, um, and we use Python bindings to leverage that technology. So this is uh, an example of how I'd use GDAL warp, and um, what it takes in is the tile bound. So um, we'll do, we do a calculation to figure out what bounds uh, are the, the, tile, the tile represents. In this particular example, looking at bounds in 4326, because there are different projections. Um, I guess the other aspect that I could go into as well is that um, this, uh, this method also allows us to use data that's produced in different native projections, uh, which is something that um, you know, different systems use and produce, uh, especially at like, different countries and regions. Um, and we can, we can use this to uh, essentially create like one format that al allows all geospatial software to use. Um, so this, uh, in this example, we've got those bounds. Um, produces the tiles in uh, 256 by 256 pixels, which is the standard size of a tile in the slippy map format, although you can use 512 by 512 for high definition tiles. Uh, and then we use Boto3 to upload the tiles. So this is an example. This is an example of uploading a, a tile to, uh, uploading an image and uh, uploading a tile to uh, an S3 store, although you could use this, this type of code to essentially upload uh, any type of file to uh, an S3 store as well. Oh, sorry. Let me break out of this for a second. All right. So I'm just going to run a script now. And so this script, I just wanted to show you kind of uh, just to give you more of an active example of how you, I'm, I'm running this script, and this is uploading the tile. So you could see this as really as like two different processes. So it's the tile pipeline of like creating that data, and then the, the visualization of creating the API to deliver that data. And so I can, I'll run this script. Now you can see that as the, uh, the script runs, um, it's gone through and it's created tiles at different zoom levels, different tiles at different zoom levels. And the output is in this map directory. So now you can see that um, what it's taken is one big large file, and then it's separated up into these individual map tiles. So uh, the next step we're going to look at is creating an API to modify the data in stream. So uh, what do I mean by that? So what, the, um, what, I'm, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to modify this data and change properties of the data, but without uh, saving it to a server. So being able to, to modify that data in the byte stream and be able to give that those, those, that real-time data update to the end user. Um, so we, in our, our system retrieves a tile from that data store. Um, then it, our API then uses Pillow um, 
to modify that data, and then that modified data gets, then gets returned to the client. So I'm just going to give you an example of this. Uh, so this, this tool that I'm using is uh, QJS. And QJS is uh, a tool that you can use to uh, visualize map tiles. It's uh, also a great open source project. So what I'm going to load first is this is actually the original file. And that's one of the reasons why you can see those bands associated with it, the red, green, and blue band. Um, and this is, yeah, so this is the, uh, the original, original data, and it was a single file. So I can zoom into that. So now I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to start my, my Flask API endpoint. And so what it's done here is it's retrieving the data from that store. And um, and by no means am I giving you an example of great usable data in this presentation, but this is um, an example of how I've taken that, that original image from the data store and then I've brightened it up substantially. Um, but in no, but this, this data never actually had to be like, saved to the device and then modified and then returned. It was all done in that fly stream. This is an example of doing just a a PNG overlay. So I had a, a single PNG that was saved on the server, and then as it came through the API, it pasted the PNG over the top of the image that it retrieved from that data store. Uh, this is something that you could also, I've just put a, uh, a simple PNG here, but you could use you know, polygons or point vector data and paste that over the top, um, or any other assets that you would like to show on, on your tiles. And then um, lastly, I was going to show you an example of applying a histogram. Now, again, you know, I, I know it's actually doing the histogram to individual tiles at the moment. So it's essentially, so you can see it's a bit patchy in terms of how it's displayed. But I think what I really wanted to demonstrate by doing this is just the, the simple flexibility that you have. So you, there's really nothing that you can't do with this data. Um, so this is <laughs> it's a, very, a very simple example of the API endpoint uh, that we just used. But I restricted it just to show you the, um, the way that it actually brightens the data. And um, just as uh, I thought it would take a long time to go through all the, all the other functions. Um, but see, so you can see here that we're res um, retrieving those parameters. So the layer name, the zoom, the row, the column. So we can locate that tile. Then we, after we get that, that imagery back from the S3 service, we're applying that brightness filter directly to that data, enhancing that data, and then ret uh, returning it directly back in the, in the byte stream. Um, so uh, after all of that, what I was going to, what I'd really like to show you as well, is just an example of um, you know, one of the use cases that um, it, you can use, it, use this data for. So after you've created that API, um, you can use that for um, you know, full stack development, creating uh, you know, mapping applications where you could use custom raster data that could be retrieved and used by that, uh, that data source. Uh, in this example, we're using a um, csim.js, um, which uh, utilizes the 3.js library, uh, the JavaScript 3, 3.js library, to create a 3D globe. Uh, on that 3D globe, then we can place that raster imagery. Um, 
This project was also created um, with React, um, and I distributed the, the front end um, onto an S3 bucket, and um, the data is being delivered by a Lambda function on AWS. So here's the, uh, here's the globe. Now this, is, this globe is, um, the, the imagery that is on this globe is provided by Bing Maps. So that would be satellite imagery produced in the same pro using the same processes that we just saw. So we're just going to zoom into the map. OK, so and here we've got that that map that we were looking at before. But now we're seeing that all of the, uh, the tiles on this 3D globe, and we can navigate around. And just an example to show you. So we're using that Bing, Bing um, data service, and that's the, the quality of the data that they're producing uh, from, from satellite data. And this is the aerial imagery that was produced by that data set. You can see how much you can zoom in and, and see that, that level of quality, um, which I think is really quite good for um, you know, open source imagery. There is a, a few little hiccups in the data that I've seen, but for something that was completely open source and available, I thought it was really good. And as a part of this, you can you load it up and you can see the might be looking the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, so you can that way you can combine different data sources, um, which I wasn't going to go into today, but you can see there's a there's a terrain data source in the background, then you've got that you can see that 2D uh, like imagery and see what is around those areas, and you can also, you know, potentially like drape the uh, the two D Im uh, imagery over uh, the three D terrain and other, you know, interesting way. There is a lot of other interesting ways to use the data. So I feel like I might have gone quite fast today, but. <laughs> That was, uh, that was my full presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. Because we finished earlier, we can take questions. So any questions from the audience? And then we can. So I have one here. I'm just curious if you've looked at dynamically generating the slippy tiles themselves from like an upstream data source so that you can avoid having to process all of that original data source. Uh, have you looked at doing that sort of thing dynamically? Or could you sorry, what was that like? So, so if you're pulling in some data like that and you got, and then you slice that up into tiles, that's cool. But what if the original data set is absolutely huge and you only want to bring in subsets of that dynamically? Can you generate the slippy tiles dynamically on demand? Uh, yeah, there, there is ways of doing that. Um, but I've actually found, like, especially with the large data sets, it's, it's, it's more difficult. Um, I've had success with um, creating um, large image data stores on uh, single servers. And I can use a GDAO, and actually, I think it, it you, if you were looking for, you know, like an ad hoc solution, I can, I can, you can potentially set up something that can cut and deliver those tiles uh, on on one one server. But in terms of actually being able to provide that service to a, um, a more distributed user base, then I found that that it's, um, yeah, it's just not not efficient enough. So, um, but. Um, but yeah, if, if you were just doing this for, say, for instance, like an internal network, um, there is ways of just, just doing it more like creating the data on the fly and being able to keep that data in its original format.
Any other question? Just trying to find hands. Uh, up there, I have to. You go there. Yep. Cool. So let's check on the Discord channel in the meanwhile. Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask about the um, when you overlay the logo as like a watermark. If you could do geo specific, and I think you've kind of answered this with your last slide here. So if you, uh, yeah, could you explain how you did the thank you? Because that's kind of like, I assume, annotating a single tile based on some conditional parameters or something like that. Oh, sure. Actually, the, the thank you was um, part of the, the, the framework that I provided. It wasn't, wasn't the tiles. But, um, the, but you can do geospatial specific data. So. Um, you could overlay that with uh, any sort of data that you want, you know, vector data, um, potentially other raster data if you wanted to layer um, like additional raster data. So you know, the possibilities are uh, endless. This uh, this was a part of the uh, the CSIM framework. So if I was to actually like go on the side, okay, <laughs> you, you could you could do that. If you did it further upstream, would that be in the Generating the rest, I guess it would be, would be, or did you do that with the flask, where you're kind of on the fly manipulating it? Oh uh, no! So this, this is this is uh, this is all part of the front end framework, mm. the, um, the CSIM front end framework. But if you wanted to splice in other geo type data, would, is that something you could do with the tiles? Because I think you kind of mentioned annotating it with some other bits. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And sorry, would that be that be done through the flask type? piece you had where you're doing the brightness and other bits, because that was kind of applied to all tiles. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as the, I said, the kind of the possibility is endless. So yeah. I mean, the, the data that's coming through that, um, the Python API is like you're retrieving essentially like single part tiles. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the freedom that you have like using, like utilizing Pillow yeah. or other, uh, other libraries, I think with the, um, uh, uh, you know, but I didn't go into it entirely, but when I was doing that histogram data, I was actually using yep. a CV to do the histogram. So I was actually circumnavigating around um, Pillow. Um, mm. But there is like endless possibilities of like how you can manipulate that data and how you can apply, like, you know, geospatial assets and then, uh, um, you know, retrieve it to that. So you could flow. do it at that layer because Pillow is just sort of general image manipulation, isn't it? So you could do the geo stuff at that kind of bit as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so. I guess it, it, and it really comes down to like efficiency. So if you mm. wanted to, um, if you wanted to do that manipula manipulation there, you could. Um, another service that you can use with, uh, you know, geospatial data. One of the more common um, data sources is uh, um, like MVT uh, vector data tiles. Yeah. Um, one of the great things about using like you know vector data, so actually having yeah. being able to split up, split up those two services, is um, that you can have the vector data embedded within that tile, and then being able to, you know, directly query that data in the front end interface, which is something you can't do with the raster data. Yep. So uh, generally, with the products that I've made in the past, um, I. I typically do split that split those data yeah, sources up. Yep. And and you could do that in the previous desktop app you had, but you'd also do that with Cesium and have those two different layers. Sorry, could you speak oh, up just a little bit? Yeah, sorry, it's really weird. Okay. Oh there we go. Um so you could do that both in this front end as well. So you kind of had the image data set and then have the vectors as a separate layer. Yeah, so that and that would that would be typically done in like the, the front end framework that yep. we use. Um, you know, as, as for this one, I'm using um, CCM, uh, J, uh, CCM JS, which is um, you know allows you to to be able to display um, you know 3D data, 2D data. Um, but you know, we, uh, I've I've also used like open layers and Mapbox and yep. other different front end frameworks where it, the the processes would be slightly different. Um, one of the things that I really do love about CCM is it's actually, from my own experience, it's the most difficult to use, but it has the most freedom in yeah. what you can do with it. Cool. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, I've got one and then you. Okay, cool. Cheers. 
Um, so kind of tacking off the question um, about the vector data and the raster data, is it possible to apply a similar technique to the, um, the actual terrain map itself and sort of patch in height data into the map? Um, well, with the, um, I think if, if I was to, so yeah, there's definitely different data, uh, data sources. So you can have terrain data, you can have 3D, um, you know, 3D uh, tiles, which are, you know, essentially you can create like 3D buildings. Um, and um, at the moment I work on a project where we, um, we bring in uh, LiDAR data or like, you know, point data. So, uh, and typically we combine those data sources like on, on, on the, that front end interface. If um, you can um, manipulate the terrain actually with the front end framework. So um, the, the front end framework can manipulate that data as it comes in and say like, for instance, if you wanted to say in this particular area, I don't want to display terrain. You could just ask the front end framework to remove that. Um, and then if you wanted to bring in another data source, I'd recommend doing that more in the front end than the back end. Awesome, thanks. Um, you mentioned, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> this. Oh, OK. Yeah, then. sorry. You mentioned that uh, you applied a histogram to one of the pictures, right? One of the small tiles. And you got those patchy results. Can you apply it on a much larger scale uh, as well and then um, uh, break it up afterwards? Or how would you do that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Actually, it's, it's really what you saw was kind of um, more or less up where I was up to in my own personal research. <laughs> so um, what when I was, uh, you know, experimenting with what, uh, what capabilities that I had, I was able to create those histograms with those individual tiles. Um, I think that, you know, that's something that you possibly could do and actually be able to, um, you know, provide that histogram to large areas. Um, but that's something that I haven't experimented with yet. But it's something I'm, I'm, I'm interested in experimenting with in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry if this question's off topic. Um, my team wants to self-host open street map tiles to be consumed by a leaflet client. Where should we begin? Uh, so you want to use um, open street map tiles and you want to use leaflet to be able to deliver them? That's correct, yeah. Um, I mean, I think if, if I was to tackle that project myself, it would really just be like, you know, setting up um, a... Um, you know, a, a leaflet project and then using the uh, OpenStreetMap tiles. In that example that I showed you before, that was, uh, you know, OpenStreetMaps uh, here on the bottom. So, you know, OpenStreetMaps has a open, readily available API to be able to attain that data, um, which is also a raster data st uh, source, which would have, which can be, you know, constructed in a, in a similar sort of fashion. But um, essentially, if you were just looking to get this data, you know, it's, it's really just about going through that process of setting up um, the, the leaflet system. Um, you know, personally, I think that if I was going to do a project like that, I would be, um, I'd be looking at something like um, open street, uh, like open layers, just to provide a bit more, um, you know, freedom in, you know, what, how I could manipulate and display the data. But, you know, leaflets are, are still a great solution as well. Um, but I think those, those two technologies match up perfectly well, so it's really just, um, I don't think there's any real challenges there. All right, with that, uh, we ran out of time now, but uh, the Discord channel is always open for questions, and if you can then pop up to check if there's any other questions about the talk. So we're gonna now thank you, Oli, for this great presentation. And here's a note in a mug for you. As a thank, thank you. you. All right, so we're